Mr. Furniment, your faithful friend when muscles ache in pain, presents... Gangbusters! Gangbusters, brought to you, the men and women of America, by the makers of Sloan's Liniment. With the cooperation of leading law enforcement officials of the United States, Gangbusters presents facts in the relentless war of the police on the underworld. Authentic case histories that show the never-ending activity of the police in their work of protecting our citizens. America's crusade against crime. Now, for those of you who are familiar with the name Schwarzkopf, just an editorial note, and we'll get right back to the program. Colonel Schwarzkopf, who uh, oftentimes interviews the uh, uh, lawman who brings in the story to gangbusters, is, of course, uh, in actuality, uh, the father of H. Norman Schwarzkopf, general of the United States Army, uh, and so this is kind of interesting to hear him portrayed, uh, his father portrayed as a law enforcer. And also interesting, uh, there's a, uh, the character of the lawman, a sheriff, uh, I'm sorry, a judge who comes on the program, Judge Miller, is played by none other than Bill Johnstone, who about the same time was playing The Shadow on the Mutual Network. So there's a couple of interesting voices to listen for here. Now for our proxy interview between Colonel Schwarzkopf and Judge L.D. Miller of Chattanooga, Tennessee. Picture our setting as a special office turned over to gangbusters by Commissioner Louis J. Valentine of the New York City Police. Colonel Schwarzkopf. Judge Miller, I understand that Charleston and Rogers, the nickel and dime bandits, were hunted by the police of six states. Yes, Colonel Schwarzkopf. Actually, eight different police departments were after them within a period of 30 days. But why do you call these particular criminals the nickel and dime bandits? Well, Colonel, James Carlson, the brains of the combination, had a theory of crime different from any criminal in all my experience. through the Mississippi Valley pulling little jobs, nickel and dime jobs. When we pulled enough of these nickel and dime jobs, we'll have just as much jack as if we'd stuck up a dozen big banks. On December 4th, 1939, following a term at Minnesota State Reformatory, Charlson drove up to a roadside tavern near Minneapolis. The owner was talking to a customer. Be right with you, mister. Anything else, sir? Oh, that'll be all, Bill. Charge it, will you? <laughs> with a fancy car like that, you want me to charge it? <laughs> no, that's right behind you, pal. Turn around. What? Look out, Billy's got a gun. A special kind of gun, mister, with a hair trigger. Come on, both of you. Back up into that hot dog joint before I turn this cannon loose on you. I want your dough. Oh, I got some change. Give it to me. Here you are. Now, you. Open up that cash register. Here. Thirty-five bucks. It's all I got. I know it ain't. Scoop out that change and stick it in my pocket. Nickels and dimes, huh? I'd like to see you for five minutes without that gun. Here's a change. Thanks, wise guy. Now get out of here. Not so fast, you. Empty your pockets. Uh, pretty brave, aren't you, with a gun? Yeah, and it's liable to go off any minute. No sort of punk's going to take my dough. I want you, wise guy. Bill. You're not getting away from me. I'll show you. Give me that gun. You're all through, punk. Let go of me. You hurt? Yeah, I guess so. Pretty bad. I got all three of those bullets, but I got his gun. You're going to need a doctor. What do we do with this guy? Lock him in the washroom. Yeah, you make it all right? Yeah, sure. Now, I got the special gun, you rat. Yeah. Give me back my money. All right. Here you are. Now, come on. You're into the washroom. You'll never get me to jail. Inside, punk. Okay, white guy. I'll lock it and inform the police. Better get an ambulance, Bill. 
You're being bad. Hello. Hello, operator. Get me the police. Sit down, Bill. What's that? The washroom window. There. Up front. There he goes. He's in his car. Stop. Stop or I'll shoot. Oh. It's jammed. That guy's special pistol jammed and saved his own life. It is rare, Judge Miller, for the victim to turn on his assailant at gunpoint and disarm him. It is, Colonel. Fortunately, the wounds of the tavern owner were not serious. Johnson made a dash for Chicago, where he went into partnership with another criminal named Joe Rogers. Together, they stole a late model car and started south, blazing a trail of robberies from Illinois to Louisiana. On the night of December 17th in Blytheville, Arkansas... Charlson and Rogers committed an unusual robbery, showing a peculiar obsession. Blytheville, Arkansas, robbery. Two men broke into a house and stole a large collection of pistols, automatics, shotguns, and rifles. Seen escaping in blue or black Dodge sedan. Notify all gun dealers to be on lookout for unusual weapons of foreign make. A few days later, Colonel, Charlson and Rogers were in Minneapolis, waiting in a stolen new Buick sedan across the street from a small apartment house. <laughs> Boy, this is the life of Rogers. You said it, Charlson. Cops and newspapers screaming about us from here to New Orleans. <laughs> Nothing for us to do but sit back and take it easy. <laughs> I'd sure like a drink right now. Yeah, so would I. Wish that baby ears would hurry up. Uh, it's only ten past eleven. I told her to sneak out a quarter past. She made up her mind to come with us? Hope so. You know me, Rogers. Wine, woman, and song. Yeah, I know. But when are we going to quit this small time stuff and go after something big? Like what? Banks. Forget it, Rogers. Knock over a bank and every cop in the States after you. Just think of the dough we could pick up in banks. Oh, we've been getting the places you pick us chicken feed. Nothing but nickels and dimes. There's nothing you can't buy with nickels and dimes, Rogers. If you got enough of them, sure, but we could... There's no but to it. It adds up, see? And the rap for little jobs is nothing like it is for a bank. But in one bank job, we... Listen, sap. Hey, take it easy, will you? Banks have guards, and the guards have guns and tear gas. They have balconies to ambush bank bandits. They have burglar alarms to call the cops. Don't you see? We can get as much in a flock of gas stations as we could in a dozen banks. And no risk. Yeah, maybe you're right. The way I figure it... Hold it, Charleston. Here comes your girlfriend. Oh. Hello, baby. Hello, Jim. Gee, I'm glad to see you. You and me both. Get in the car. Okay. It's my pal, Joe Rogers. Oh, pleased to meet you. How are you? Oh, what's up? Where are we going? We're going south, kid. How'd you like to go with us? South? Oh, gee, I'd love to, but what about my folks? <laughs> Send them a postcard. Yeah. Just say, having a wonderful time. I wish you were here. <laughs> Hey, what are you guys going to do? We got special ideas. Swell clothes, good liquor, and plenty to keep us busy. What do you say? I say, what are we waiting for? Baby, you're going to be perfect. Let's go, Rogers. Where to? Back to New Orleans, where it's nice and warm. But we're going to make some stops on the way. And where we stop, nobody's ever going to forget us. This will be a joy ride to remember. That was near midnight, Colonel, on December 21st, 1939. Three days later, Chief C.R. Bryan of the Chattanooga, Tennessee Police was sitting in his office when Police Captain Homer Edmondson walked in with a message in his hand. Good morning, Captain. Good morning, Chief Bryan. This just came in on the teletype. Thought you'd like to look at it. From Sweetwater, huh? Yes, sir. Arrest two men wanted here for robbery of roadside cafe this morning, 3 a.m. One man about 20, weight 150, blue eyes, light hair. The other one, older, weight about 140, dark hair, slender. Both bandits wearing leather jackets. That's a pretty complete description, Chief. These bandits took $60 in currency, cigarettes, liquor, and a large amount of nickels and dimes. They're heavily armed. Large amount of nickels and dimes, that sounds familiar. You're right, Captain. This is the sixth report in the last few days that used those exact words. Yes, and each report was near Chattanooga. And you broadcast this message to the patrol cars? Yes, sir. Right after it came in. Send it out again, Captain. This is the first good description we've had of those men. 
they try anything here, I want every man on the force to be waiting for them. Right, Chief. Wait a second. Chief Bryan speaking. Assistant cops over quit, Chief. I've just been robbed. Who's this? Jack Parker. I've got a filling station at Maiden Watkins. I just opened up ten minutes ago and two guys walked in and... Hold on a minute. Captain, there's been a holdup over at Maiden Watkins, a filling station. Send a patrol car over there right away. Right away, Chief. Go ahead, Mr. Parker. What happened? These two guys walked in, Chief. They both wore leather jackets. They had four guns between them, and they cleaned out the cash register. How much did they get? Seven bucks. Almost all small change. Nickels and dimes, huh? Well, I know it don't sound like much, Chief, but it's a lot to me. Mr. Parker, I don't care if it was seven cents or seven million dollars. If these bandits are the men I think they are, they're going to try to pull some more jobs like this here in Chattanooga, and we're going to get them. The next afternoon, Colonel, the woman manager of a small dry goods store in Chattanooga saw two men, apparently customers, walking into her store. May I help you, gentlemen? Yeah. Let me see some shirts. The best you got. And I want to see some socks and ties. Certainly. Right over here. What size shirt, sir? Fifteen collar, thirty-four sleeves. And I want size eleven socks. Here they are. Just take your pick. That's just what we're going to do, sister. Stick them up. <laughs> Hold them. Take it easy, sister. One peep out of you and I'll drill you. Please. Get down on the floor behind our counter. And don't move if you want to live. These yes, pretty, sir. Pretty fancy looking socks, pal. Get some for me. And the shirts you're getting. Silk. The most expensive I can find. Oh, please. Fast. Okay. These here look swell. Green silk. You ready, pal? Yeah, let's go. Hey, sister, where's your cash register? There, in the back of the counter. But there's only a... I know, I know. There's only a little change. That's what they all say. How much, pal? Ten bucks and about five and change. Thanks for the service, lady. We'll be sure to tell our friends about you. And remember, sister, if you move off that floor before or out of this store, it'll be the last time you ever move. Exactly 44 minutes later, Colonel, in a Chattanooga liquor store on the other side of town... Uh, will that be all, gentlemen? Just the three bottles of whiskey? No, that ain't all, mister. Reach for the ceiling. All right. What do you want? Don't shoot him, pal. The cops might hear you get. All right. Keep him covered. Okay. And what are you going to do? I'm going to teach you not to be so nosy. Oh, oh. That'll teach you to ask me what I want. Oh, now, no, please. No. Please don't kick me again. Come on, pal. Let's get out of here. Get the dough. Okay. Take everything, even a small change. How much is it? Yeah, there's about 90 bucks here. Hey, here's something else, pal. A nice new gap for your collection. Say, not so bad. Different from any I got. Maybe I ought to try it out on this wise guy. No, no, please. Okay, please. mister, but just so you won't run after us, here's something more to remember us. But... Oh. That brutal holdup was the third the nickel and dime bandits committed in the heart of Chattanooga within 24 hours, Colonel. It redoubled the efforts of the police to catch Charleston and Rogers and resulted in a gun battle that Chattanooga will long remember. Law enforcement officers within a radius of 50 miles of Chattanooga cooperated. At a special meeting of police representatives at the office of Chief C.R. Bryant, all possible angles were discussed. Uh, fortunately, men, we have a complete description of these two bandits and definite identification clues. What are they, Chief Bryant? Well, first, Tussman, there's the nickel and dime angle. So anyone seen spending an unusual amount of silver is a definite suspect. Then there's the gun angle. The gun angle? It's this, Frazier. These men are crazy about guns. They take pride in them. Not just as weapons, but as items to collect. Hmm, so the bandits might just show off their guns sometime without staging a holdup, huh? Particularly if they'd been drinking. And that's still another clue, Chief Bryan. The amount of liquor they consume, judging by the amount they've stolen. And the girl with them, the one that's been seen in their car. Now, we have her description. All right, Captain Edmondson. These are all valuable clues, men. And we have one other advantage. From what these bandits have said to their victims, they don't expect the police to go after them seriously. Just because the thefts have been relatively small, huh? Exactly. Hmm. That gives me an idea, Chief. What is it, Edmondson? Maybe we can get these bandits through a weakness in their own system. How, Captain? Let's give these clues to every reliable citizen in the vicinity of Chattanooga. Every small storekeeper. Then when the bandits do show up again, they'll be spotted immediately. Good yeah, 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 yeah. Well, then it's understood every available man is to stay on duty till these bandits are behind bars. I want them in custody before somebody gets killed. Within one hour after that meeting, Colonel, merchants, filling station employees, liquor store proprietors, business people all over Chattanooga... We're planning to cooperate with the police. Cooperate with police? 
Listen, I'm staying right here at the store. If those bandits come back this way, I'm going to be ready for them. If this is those nickel and dime crooks come anywhere near me, I'm going to call the police. I'll know them if I ever see them again. I'll be glad to cooperate. I've got a score to settle with those rats, and I'd like to see them both behind bars. If they ever come into my place, I'll... Nickels and dimes, eh? I get it. If those buzzards stick their noses in my place, I'll be waiting for them. You can count on me. That night, Colonel, December 26, 1939, at the Rock Castle Roadhouse, ten miles west of Chattanooga, the cashier, Bill Rafer, was standing behind his counter. Hey, yo, cashier. Yes, sir? I want a bottle of whiskey. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. We're not allowed to sell liquor in bottles, except the guests of Rock Castle. I'm a guest here. Me and my pal are in one of the cabins right next door. Oh, I'm begging your pardon. Sure. Uh, here you are. That'll be uh, 165, please. You'll have to take it and change. Change? Fiscal, buddy. Here. 25, 50, dollar, 10, 20, 30, 55, 65. Right. Thank you, sir. Your bet is right. Say, what are you staring at? Oh, why, I... See anything wrong with me? No, I... I was just thinking what a good-looking green silk shirt you have on. Oh, that, yeah. Yeah, it is good-looking. Everything I got's good-looking. Look at this. Hey, hey, watch... Ah, don't be scared. I ain't gonna use it on you. Boy, that's some pistol. <laughs> Bet your life it is. Special automatic. Only one like it in the country. Yes, sir. Well, I- is there anything else you want? Yeah, yeah, sure. I almost forgot. Give me, uh, give me uh, some of those box lunches you got, huh? How many? Let's see now. Uh, three. Yes, three. Here they are. Do you want me to carry them for you? Yeah, that's right. I'm getting a little rocky. Hey, Joe, take over, will you? Okay. I'll be right back. Let's go, sir. Now, which cabin is it? Second one on the left. Is this the cabin? Yeah, yeah, I'll look. Hey, hold it up. Come on, come on, come on, open it up. It's me. Come on. Pipe down, will you? Come on, let me in. Where's me? I reckon I'll be getting along, mister. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. See you later, mister. Good night. Yeah, I'll see you later. Operator, operator, get me the police. Chief, listen, this is Bill Raper out at Rock Castle. Yes, Bill? Those two nickel and dime crooks you're looking for, they're here. How do you know? I'm positive, Chief. Every single clue you give me. The, the nickels and dimes, the, the guns, the liquor, everything checks. Did you notice a car? Yes, sir. It's a big, black, new 1940 Buick. Where are they? In a cabin right next door. How many? Three of them, sir. Two men and a girl. That's what I call fine cooperation, Bill. Sit tight and don't say a word to anyone. Yes, sir. I'll send an emergency squad out there right away. Fifteen minutes later, Colonel, Captain Homer Edmondson with a group of picked men from the Chattanooga Police Force, including Detective Shipley and Carson, met members of the county uniform police under Captain Dyer outside the Rock Castle Roadhouse. The cashier, Bill Raper, was waiting for them. Which cabin are they in, Mr. Raper? That one with the lights on, Captain Edmondson. All right, men. Sussman and Fraser, you stick with me. All right, Captain. Captain. Now, we'll go to the front of the house. Shipley, you and Carson cover the back with Captain Dyer. You got that? Right, Captain. What's our plan, Captain? Simply to close in and get those bandits. We can't start shooting till we're absolutely sure these are the men we want. But if they show the slightest resistance, open fire with riot guns immediately. Ready? Yes, sir. Let's go. Watch it. They turned out the lights. Better stand back. I'll knock. Open up. Who is it? Police. Just a minute. Hurry it up. All right, coppers. Come and get it. Go back, friend. Just listen, those bullets bounce. All right, men, open up with your riot guns. Right, Captain. Get down low, babe. Those cops are using riot guns. We'll fix them, Jimmy. I'll load your pistols. Roger. Yeah? Cover the back door. I'll cover the front. Okay, Charleston. 
Come on, coppers. Try and take it. You'd better give up in there. You're surrounded. We'll give up hot lead. Give me another cat, babe. This one's empty. Here you are, Jimmy. How is it in the back, Rogers? Can't see him. It's too dark out there. Well, they're all around us, Jimmy. Keep oh. down, babe. Oh. Babe, you hit. Oh, my head. I told you to keep down. <laughs> all right, coppers. You got my gal. I'll oh, show sure you can't get away with that. Charleston. Charleston, there's a copper creeping up in the back. You cover the front, Rogers. I'll get that cop. He's coming right up to the back door. What are you going to do, Jimmy? Shut up, babe. I'm running this show. Open your hands, all three of you. I'm waiting for you, cop. Jimmy, you killed him. I'll say I killed him. I got his gun, too. Jimmy, they got Rogers. Lie down on the floor, babe. I'll get him for that. All right, coppers. I got one of you. Who's next? Yes, Fraser. They killed Shipley. Shipley? How? He broke in the back door. Shot down before he had a chance. Oh, the dirty dogs. Give me a rat gun, Fraser. Yes, mine's empty. Captain... I'm going after him. Now, wait. Don't go up there. It's probably a trap. There goes one of them out the side door. Stop her up fire. He's running for the woods. I can't see him. There, between those big trees. <laughs> Missed him. It's so dark, I can't see. Oh, we'll never find him in this darkness. And what we do, Captain? He might be hurt. Dyer, you and Carson follow him. I am going to get some bloodhounds. <laughs> What's the matter with the dogs, Captain? Why are they stopping? Too dark for them? I'm afraid they lost the trail, Fraser. What, after we've followed their banner for almost eight miles? It's all right, Sussman. Those bloodhounds have told me just what I want to know. Uh, that'll get you, Captain. For the last two miles, the bandit's trail has followed right along these railroad tracks. That's right. But now we've lost it. I can't see what that is. We're headed toward Chattanooga, not away from it. Doesn't that mean anything to you men? You mean you thought maybe the bandit would... Jump afraid away from Chattanooga? No, Sussman. I thought he'd head for Chattanooga, but I'm, I couldn't be sure. Now I know he's gone back to the city, where we can lay our hands on him. With one of the nickel and dime bandits, Joe Rogers, dead, Colonel, and the bandit's girlfriend in a prison hospital, the Chattanooga police combed the city for the remaining bandit, now definitely identified as James Charlson. Later that night, after visiting hundreds of rooming houses... Two police officers, Patrolman Fraser and Sussman, climbed the stairs of a cheap rooming house an hour after midnight. What number did the landlady say, Fraser? Room six. Yeah. It's room number six, right up there at the head of the stairs. Yeah. Landlady said her new boarder arrived an hour ago. Have your gun ready. But I will, Sussman. You turn on your flashlight. I'll try the door. Right. Doors unlocked. That's lucky. Careful now. Easy, easy. There, he's in bed. Sound asleep. Wonder if he's a guy we want. He's pretty young for a bandit. Let's make sure, Sussman. Pull down the covers. A pistol there in his right hand. And another one next to him. He's starting to wake up. Grab him. I'm with you. Look on him. I didn't do nothing. I got him, Fraser. Put the braces on him. Charlton, you're all through. You come to crazy. I'm not the guy you want. No. General Wright, Fraser. I... Let's see those two guns. That don't prove nothing, Cobbler. I didn't kill nobody. I like guns, see? I, I collect them. Yeah? Well, this is one gun you never should have collected, Charlton. It's the gun you took from Detective Shipley after you killed him. And it's the last gun you're ever going to collect. And so, Colonel Schwarzkopf, through splendid police work, an excellent citizen cooperation, the criminal activities of James Charlson came to an abrupt end. Placed on trial in my court for robbery and murder on February 27th, 1940, he was quickly found guilty. I sentenced him to life imprisonment in the Tennessee State Penitentiary. He is there at this very moment. And what happened to the girl who was with Charlson and Roger, Judge Miller? For months, she hovered between life and death with a bullet touching her brain. 
The doctor said her mental faculties would be impaired indefinitely, and under the circumstances, she was freed in the custody of her parents. Thank you, Judge Miller, for a fine case. I'm particularly pleased with the way you brought out the great value of public cooperation with the authorities. When the police thus frankly solicit help from our law-abiding citizens, and those citizens promptly and comprehensively cooperate, no criminal can escape. Every time the police and the people work together, the end is inevitable. Crime does not pay. And now, the clues. Special bulletin, all citizens. Watch for murderer, 24, 5 feet 5 inches, 135 pounds, dark brown hair slicked back, brown eyes. This man with tall, sandy-haired companion, having wrinkled face, wanted for brutal murder several days ago, refrigeration engineer near San Antonio, Texas, may be traveling in black, Ford station wagon, and may have in possession a 44 caliber Smith & Wesson revolver with cedar handle. Warning, citizens of Pennsylvania, be on lookout for man, 28, 5 feet 8 inches, 160 pounds, brown hair, gray eyes, occupation farmer. This man wanted in connection with feud slaying last week. Indian Head section of Fayette County, Pennsylvania. If you have any information concerning these clues, notify your local police, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, or gangbusters at once. For Sloan's Liniment next week, the case of the missing corpse. Here reenacted for the first time, the inside factual account of one of the most fantastic cases in all criminology. Learn how a dead man faced his murderer... Sloan's Liniment brings you one of Philip H. Lord's most astounding dramatizations in America's crusade against crime. <laughs> <laughs>